Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to the monthly uh, webinar by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. It's 6 p.m. in Paris, 1 p.m. in Sao Paulo, uh, noon in New York, 7 p.m. in Jerusalem, uh, 6, 5 p.m. in London. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to uh, this uh, special monthly webinar uh, dedicated to Fanconi anemia. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University in St. Antoine Hospital in Paris in France. And it is uh, my great honor today to introduce Professor Carmen Bonfim from Brazil. Uh, she, is, she is the head of the pediatric of uh, blood and marrow transplantation program at Hospital uh, Pequeno Principi, I hope I'm pronouncing well. She's also a professor at the Pele Pequeno Principi Research Institute and at the Federal University of Parana in Curitiba, Parana, Brazil. And as you may guess, uh, her major interest is in uh, bone marrow failures and immune, uh, primary immune deficiencies. And uh, she has been with her team doing really a marvelous job to improve the outcome uh, of these rare diseases. We know that uh, these are really uh, areas of unmet medical needs and people like Professor Bonfim have committed uh, their career to advance this field and we are really very fortunate uh, having her with us today. So, of course, as usual, please don't hesitate to post your questions and comments. We will have a few minutes for discussion at the end of the webinar. But for the time being, I'd like to hand the podium and the microphone to you, Carmen, and welcome to this ICH webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. And thank you also, Annalisa, for inviting me to present this data on Fanconi anemia. This is a very, very uh, special subject to me. And I would like to start by saying that I have no disclosures related to this presentation. And also, uh, this is the most important slide that I want to share with all of you. We did the first BM, uh, trans, uh, bone marrow transplant in Latin America here in Curitiba in 1979. And the first transplant for Fanconi anemia in 1983. So we had all these decades of involvement treating this disease. But Fanconi anemia is a rare disease and without national and international collaboration, we cannot improve patient care and clinical research. And this slide shows only the collaborators we, we had regarding stem cell transplantation because we had a lot more for diagnosis and also a lot of other collaborators regarding the long-term follow-up. So keep this slide in mind because this is very, very important. So this is the outline of the lecture today. We will talk about, I would like to show you what we did regarding matched related transplant because this was the first step for us. And then we proceed to unrelated transplant and just very recently, we started to do the haplo uh, PTSI approach. And of course, we need also to think about the long-term follow-up regarding all these kinds of, uh, of transplant. So let's begin by with the, the, the definition of Fanconi anemia, because this is a rare disease characterized by genomic instability. Most patients have progressive bone marrow failure, congenital abnormalities, and this is striking predisposition to, my, to the development of myelodysplastic syndrome, acute myeloid leukemia, and especially head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Although most of the patients are diagnosed around the age of four to five, six years old, we are now seeing more and more patients. And nowadays, 20% of our patients are adult uh, with FA. So it's exactly this genomic instability that leads to uh, this impaired DNA repair. And, and, uh, and it's also to increase chemo and radiation toxicity. And this makes a challenge to do transplant for these patients, especially because transplantation is the only treatment able to cure the hematological complications related to this disease. And it's usually indicated before the onset of chronic transfusions or of course, clonal evolution. However, uh, although transplantation can cure the hematological complication, it does not cure the other manifestations of the disease. 
And also because of the genomic instability, transplant strategies need to be needs to be modified. And also we need to always to screen potential family donors. Results are excellent worldwide. When you have young patients transplanted in a plastic phase from matched related or matched unrelated donors, this is a piece of cake. The problem now lies in adult patient, transplanting adult patients, transplanting patients with advanced disease, those with mismatched donors, and also the prevention and early detection and treatment of cancer. Our, also, Fonconi is a very challenging disease to manage, not only because of all this uh, genomic instability and also the challenges rela related to transplantation, but when you put these all together in a developing country, you can see that your patients may come from very low socioeconomic back background and you have to add this to the burden of the disease. So maybe why um, Mohammed and Annalisa invited us to talk, maybe it's because of the experience we have here in Brazil. And this is always always started by my mentor, Professor Ricardo Pasquini. And up in from 1983 until now, until today, we have transplanted more than 400 patients and around 160 patients from 2013 onward. We are located here in the south of Brazil in this city called Curitiba, and it's a very beautiful city with almost 2 million inhabitants. So we, uh, most of the patients were transplanted using a bone marrow from matched related, uh, unrelated donors, but we also included 66 haploidentical transplant. We also have quite a good experience uh, using cord blood transplants in 46 patients. So let's start with the matched uh, related bone marrow transplantation. We progressively decreased the dose of cyclophosphamide initially 200 milligrams. That's what everybody did when they didn't know about FA uh, very well. And then we decreased until we, we reached a dose of 60 milligrams per kilo of cyclophosphamide. So I, I just want to show you the data from the patients transplanted from 1999 to 2021. We have 101 patients in a plastic phase. Of course, we always screen family donors for FA. And for these patients transplanted in, in, in a plastic phase with these matched related donors, the preparatory regimen that we use includes only cyclophosphamide, four doses of 15 milligrams per kilo. We add ATG when patients are older than 10, and the graphesosos disease prophylaxis is performed with cyclosporine on met and methotrexate, and more recently, when we have access to cyc with cyclosporine and mycophenolate. All patients all received bone marrow. And by using this very, very simple regimen, we have achieved this wonderful overall survival. And you can see here that for the past 10 years, we have transplanted 42 patients and we have 100% of survival. So this uh, protocol is associated with a very low incidence of primary and secondary graft failure, as well as acute and chronic graft host disease. In the two-year transplant-related mortality is only 4%. So this can be reproduced in many other countries with similar resources. And remember again, uh, the only major problem that we have now is regarding long-term follow-up because these patients are cured from their hematological complications related to, this, to, to the disease. But if you do not have a matched unaffected sibling available, what you do next will really depend on where you live and the resources you have. Resources and access are the main, main words that we have here, but because you need to confirm the diagnosis of an inherited aplastic anemia. And this is quite difficult because this delays the diagnosis of these patients and they come to the unit already heavily transfused and with a lot of uh, infections. You need money and, and to look, find and pay for unrelated donor searches and grafts worldwide. And you also have to have access to specific drugs or T cell depletion uh, techniques. So we are very fortunate in Brazil that we have the third biggest uh, don uh, bone marrow donor uh, registered in the world with more than 5 million donors and approximately 75% of our donors are found in the Brazilian register. However, even though we can find donors, minorities are still underrepresented even in our register. 
And when you look at the price, you can see that a Brazilian cord or a Brazilian donor can cost around $2,000, while an international donor will cost between $30,000 to $50,000, just the cost of the product. And you may think, oh, it's so easy. So let's always use a Brazilian uh, cord or donor. And, and this is not so, because the costs of maintaining a functional register is also extremely expensive. And that's why many countries around the world are not able to have a register as well, because you need government funding and sometimes patient organization. And really, you need to deal with regional donor issues and many, many specific haplotype frequencies that have to be represented in your own register. So in, in Curitiba, when we have, we don't have a matched related donor and the patient is in a plastic phase, we usually begin androgens, uh, initially with oxymetolone and more recently with danazol. We have an excellent response, uh, response rate, around 80%. But it's very important to say that disease evolution is not prevented. Patients may be older when they need a transplant and virilization and liver toxicity are important side effects. So the only thing you can buy here is time to find a better donor for your patients. So if our patients develop, uh, they are in a plastic phase and we find a match donor-related donor and we can do here high resolution typing for A, B, C, D, R, D, Q, and NDP, we always select a, a 10 out of 10 high resolution donor and we proceed to transplant as soon as this donor is identified. We always use bone marrow, and again, no irradiation is needed. And you can see here the protocol that we use for unrelated um, bone marrow trans donor transplantation. Again, look again at the dose, 60 milligrams per kilo of cyclophosphamide together with fludarabine. Fludarabine is essential when you are you, doing unrelated donor transplant. And this was a major, uh, major improvement in transplantation when we, when we found that fludarabine would improve in graftment. We also give ATG followed by bone, a bone marrow trans, uh, transplantation and cyclosporin and methotrexate. It's important to say that the dose of methotrexate is the same as the conventional uh, dose. There is no reduction in the dose of this, trans, uh, this uh, drug. So I just selected here patients transplanted a little bit more recent from 2003 to 2021, not only because of supportive care, but also because of uh, uh, because of HLA typing. And when we selected this donor, the majority were 10 out of 10 uh, fully matched and give exactly this protocol that we, we, I showed you, we have an overall survival of around uh, 8%. It's not when we compare the last 10 years for matched related that we have 100% with matched uh, unrelated, still we can see a significant difference in overall survival. And this happens not because of graft failure, graft failure is very not common in this protocol, but mainly because of Infections and infections related to the developing countries like dengue, Zika virus, toxoplasmosis, that's how you may lose these patients. There is a very low incidence of acute and chronic graft vessels host disease, too. So you see this, the, 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 this overall survival of around 8%, but when we had, during the same period, we could not find this beautiful match of unrelated donors what we had in our hands, unrelated cord blood. And when I just looked at the data from 2000 to 2011 and uh, regarding unrelated cord blood transplantation, you can see here that 82% of the patients had either a five out of six or four out of six uh, uh, cord blood mismatches. We did not have any problems regarding the, uh, the median number of nucleated cell infused. They are usually small patients. The preparatory regimen was the same as I, I showed you before with cyclophosphate, fludarabine, and ATG. But look at what happened to the survival. So while we were having 30, 70%, 80% of survival with the unrelated donor uh, uh, transplantation, when we used cord bloods, we reached only a 36 overall survival. And this happened mainly because of uh, early deaths and graft rejection. So it was exactly in this scenario where we had this very bad overall survival. We lacked in vitro T cell depletion. We had a long time and the costs related to search and graft acquisition 
detects the scenario where we decided to uh, use the haploidentical transplant. And remember that this may be the only option, not only because of ethnic minorities, but also because of the costs and logistics of finding an unrelated donor that is unavailable for many countries around the world. So for the rest of my talk, I would like to, to uh, discuss about the, how we adapt the haplo uh, PTSI approach to the treatment of patients with FA. So you have the scenario now, what was happening regarding the survival uh, for unrelated cord blood. And then that's when the group from Seattle, and these are my friends here, Reiner and Hans-Peter and, and Monica, they came to us and, and they, they said, well, well, no, we, we have this haplo PTSI protocol that it has been uh, published. You, you are so used of, uh, of using this dose of 60 milligrams per kilo of cyclophosphamide, as I showed you before. So let's try to adapt this regimen to FA patient. So this is what we did in the beginning. We decreased the dose of pre-transplant cyclophosphamide to 10 milligrams per kilo. We decreased the dose of post-transplant cyclophosphamide to 50 milligrams per kilo. And we kept the whole, uh, the other uh, uh, drugs like fludarabine, TBI, uh, cyclosporine, mycophenolate, and, and, and GCSF for these patients. So based on this was the beginning. And from 2008, when we started this protocol up until 2020, we, uh, we performed 63 uh, uh, we transplanted 63 patients, 66 transplants, all received bone marrow from haploidentical donors. The, this uh, this uh, group received the first haplo in 59 patients, but we also used this protocol to rescue patients, four patients that had failed to engraft uh, after other transplants. We included patients, most patients with aplastic anemia, but also patients with myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia. So this, the, remember the main changes that we did, did to the reduced intensity protocol from John Hopkins. So we transplanted 14 patients using this uh, approach. And we had here patients more heavily transfused, 100% were CMV positive. We also include for three patients with a, a, a active acute myeloid leukemia. In the beginning, we chose the mother because we thought that this was the best thing. And we also included patients with donor specific antibodies. But we had a lot of graft associated disease. It was so intense that we stopped the protocol for approximately two years until we decided that we had to do something to decrease the incidence of uh, graft associated disease. So that's when in 2013 we added a ATG to the protocol and we kept the whole, uh, the, the other. Uh, drugs in the same way. We also saw that because of this very intense gastrointestinal toxicity with a lot of uh, mucosides and diarrhea, oral uh, mycophenolate was not well observed. And that's when we decided to have uh, IV mycophenolate. And remember that this is not a drug available uh, in Brazil for the public health system patients. So we had a lot of help regarding the, the, the German Fanconi anemia family group to provide this drug for us in the beginning. But the, uh, because we still wanted to decrease the incidence of acute and chronic graft disease, in 2019, we changed ATG for CAMPAF. And we did that because of the results that the British and the Italian group were publishing regarding the use of CAMPAF in aplastic anemia and even in Fanconi anemia, and that they were observing less graft disease. disease. So this is the, the, uh, the demographics of this cohort. We have now patients that have received less transfusions and most of them are still CMV positive. We also included uh, 80 patients with advanced disease. We began to choose more the father and also uh, trying to avoid the female donor to male recipient. And we also had three patients that had uh, donor specific uh, antibodies. So these are the major transplant outcomes after the haplo uh, PTSI approach. You can see here in the first column that the patients without uh, serotherapy had uh, a lot of incidence of uh, CMV reactivation as well as hemorrhagic cystites, but this was common for the, for the, for the three groups. And most of the deaths call, uh, in the non-serotherapy group were, were caused by graft host disease. 
when we added ATG, we had we had three three patients that faced rejection. But this was kind of difficult because we wanted to decrease the dose of TBI. And in this group, we also tried to reduce the dose of TBI from 200 to 100 centigrade, and we faced one rejection. So we backed up, uh, backed again to the 200 centigrade uh, uh, regimen. These patients that had graft failure did not have, they were not heavily transfused and they did not have donor specific antibodies. As you can see here, most of the deaths were also caused by graft vessels disease. And for the Al alentuzumab group, we have had no deaths up until, up until now. And this, as you can see also, CME reactivation ranged from 70 to 90%, as well as a lot of hemorrhagic cystitis, something that we did not observe in them when we, we used to do the, when we did the matched related and the matched unrelated transplant. 11 out of the 12 patients older than 16 and eight out of the 11 patients with advanced disease are also alive and alive and engrafted. And if you, we can discuss this further during the Q&A session. So as you can see here, because we added ATG, we observed the uh, improvement in survival. So survival increased from 50 to uh, 82%. We also observed a, a decrease in the severity and, and the incidence of acute and chronic graft disease as uh, for the patients had almost 80% of graft vessels disease, and this was decreased to around 30%, as well as chronic uh, graft vessels disease. In the, more, in the more recent cohort, when we tried to select a, a higher dose of ATG, or when we use CAMPF, this instance of chronic graft vessels disease was further decreased. The, the use of this protocol for to salvage patients that had failed to engraft was also very good. We have four patients in this uh, uh, group. All of them are alive between seven and 12 years after transplantation and all with full donor chimerism. We also had three patients who received the first haplo and faced graft rejection. The, the ones in the ATG group, as you, as you may remember. None of these patients had any feature that we would think that they could have graft, uh, developed graft failure. All received a second haplot with a different family donors, donor and all died. So this is just to show you what happened to uh, after we began to do the, the haplo transplant. So everything started here in 2008. You can see dark blue, the haplos, the light blue, the unrelated, and the in yellow, the matched related transplant. And you can see here that in 2009 and 2011, where the last time we did an unrelated cord blood transplant for our patient, here in 2010 and 11, we began to, and, and really to, uh, around 2010 to 2012, we almost stopped the protocol until we got IV MMF and added ATG. And as you can see here, we also added AT, uh, CAMPF in 2019. We had a, long, a very, a lot of problems during the COVID pa pandemic is also because we, we did not have IV MMF. And again, the German Franconia Anemia uh, family group provided us with a donation of IV MMF. And we were able to do just this year, 15 transplants for FA. And this is also, we, we began to do again a lot of transplants a year. And just to show you very quickly, I presented this data uh, during the EBMT in Prague. And when we try to compare the unrelated cord blood group that you, I have shown you the, the demographics with the haplo PTSI, but only including the patients with serotherapy, you can see that despite the fact, the fact that the unrelated cord blood patients were transplanted until 2011, and we have a more recent regarding a supportive care for the haplo group, the haplo group included older patients patients and also more patients with advanced uh, disease. And you can see here that uh, the day 100 CMV reactivation was much higher when we used the haplo uh, uh, protocol compared with the cord blood, as well as hemorrhagic cystitis. It was 55% for the haplo group compared to only 9% for the cord blood group. And we did not see any difference regarding acute graft-vessels disease, but you can see also here that for the chronic graft-vessels disease, we had a significantly higher incidence of, the, of uh, chronic graft-vessels disease when compared to unrelated cord blood. Also, when compared to the unrelated cord blood cohort, the haplos 
PT size serotherapy platform had a much lower day 100 rejection rate. And this was from 6% compared to 31%. And this was very important because this reflected in the very high transplant related mortality that we observed in the unrelated cord blood transplantation group that ranges to almost 52% at day 100 compared to only 6% in the haplopitisai serotherapy protocol. So rejection and transplant-related mortality, mortality led to a much better uh, uh, survival for the haploserotherapy group, 82% compared to 36%. Of course, we have different uh, time uh, that these patients were receiving cords were transplanted up until 2011, and we have better supportive care now, but you can definitely see a difference regarding a graft rejection and transplant related mortality. So compared to the historical umbilical cord blood cohort, this haplopitisai platform significantly increased the survival by decreasing rejection rate and transplant related mortality. Graft failure was the major problem for unrelated cord blood, especially because they led to severe infection and this higher uh, transplant related, day 180 transplant related mortality. Uh, when we saw that, uh, when we analyzed the haplopitisai platform, we had a problem with graft source disease, CMV reactivation, hemorrhagic cystites. And this, uh, and, but this at the same time led to a better, a better survival. We think that alentuzumab may further decrease the incidence of graft source disease. But this is a recent cohort. We need short, uh, with a short follow, follow up. And just to remind everyone that our current protocol, we we included patients here in this analysis until 2020. 2021 and 2022, we have omitted the post-transplantation dose of CAMPATH, as uh, I explained to you in this, in, when I showed the, the protocol. So almost 40 years on the road, and what have we really learned so far? For matched related and, and matched uh, uh, unrelated bone marrow transplantation, we, we can see that there is a type of FA patients that are transplanted in low resources countries. And may, many people that may be watching uh, this presentation now may identify because they have, uh, because they identify their patients because they have a delayed diagnosis. These patients, they come to the unit highly transfused, infected with multi-resistant bacteria and fungal. And it's very interesting that when we get uh, as many developed countries have published, when we get patients that are, are, have not been transfused, they, these patients have almost 100% of survival, even if they are transplanted in, in, in low resources countries. We also know that better results, results are achieved when these patients are trans, transfused before transfusions, severe infections, or even development of uh, clonal uh, evolution. So for the age matched related transplant in a plastic phase, this protocol using 60 milligrams per kilo uh, with or without rabbit ATG, using bone marrow as the stem cell source, no TBI, extremely easy uh, uh, protocol to, to, to be done. Uh, we have um, now 100% of survival. So you really should aim for having at least 95% of survival. For the age HLA matched and related donors in the plastic phase, uh, we use the Psi flu ATG protocol. We also use bone marrow because this is a T cell replete transplant. So you should not use peripheral blood stem cells if you want to avoid graft SSO's disease. No TBI is needed, and we also can get excellent results in experience centers. For advanced disease, we use here for more than 10% of blasts in the bone marrow, flag, the flag, full flag, followed by the reduced intensity regimen. Uh, and this can be a, a good option. And we can discuss this further because I have not shown this data uh, in, this, in this session. So for countries, and regarding the haplopitisai transplants, for, the, for countries with limited resources, haplopitisai may be the best available option when a patient needs a transplant but has no matched related donor. People cannot afford 
pain for unrelated donor transplant, either cord blood or even uh, bone marrow donors. We can have an excellent survival using the haplopitici protocol. It reaches now 82% uh, of overall survival, but we still need some fine tuning because there is a learning curve to adapt this protocol to the treatment of all inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. We have used also this protocol, like when we think about the skeratosis congenita, or even when we, you think about other DNA breakage uh, uh, syndromes. So well, what I think is that you need to know what is inside your package. If you are doing a T cell depletion, you, you buy the whole package. You, you have more, a little bit more graft rejection. You have more infections. You may need virus specific T cells. You need very sophisticated uh, medicine. If you use the PTSI, then you need to know that you will face more graft associated disease and CMV uh, reactivation. And remember, we cannot forget about that, that when you add uh, a, a, a DNA breakage syndrome together with graft associated disease, you, have more, you may have more cancer and you need to be careful because of that. So what are the major lessons we learn? We, regarding the use of cyclophosphamide and TBI in FA, you, we can see that we have more mucocytes and more gastrointestinal uh, toxicity as well as hemorrhagic cystites. So we need to reduce the dose of cyclophosphamide. And that's why we, we, we had to reduce the dose from 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams per kilo. We had almost no problem with engraftment uh, regarding this protocol. So we could omit the dose of uh, pre-transplant size. So can you imagine you, you having graphene using fludarabine, TBI, and ATG, and you can get a very good engraftment. We also cannot decrease the dose of TBI from 200 to 100 and even to uh, take out TBI as we would love to do because TBI is needed when using this platform, maybe by using a different platform, we may uh, try to uh, take out uh, TBI. We have more uh, CMV reactivation. We have more hemorrhagic cystites with PK. So you need to think that also in developing countries, we have only access to gancyclovir. We may do not have access to foscarnit or even uh, lit, not even litemovir is not even available for us. So you need to think about that. Regarding graft source disease, please do use this protocol with serotherapy, either an ATG or CAMPATH and use bone marrow because this will decrease the incidence of graft associated disease in any transplant. Also choose well your haplodonors, young, male, and CMV compatible. But no matter what kind of transplant you do, remember that you need to screen these patients forever, especially for long-term uh, for, for cancer. So this is just to remind everyone that no matter if the patient has been transplanted or has not been transplanted, your FA patient is yours forever. So please just uh, don't forget to recommend all the things regarding the uh, business of alcohol, smoking. You need to keep good oral hygiene and, and sunscreen use because of cancer. You have all the other complications related to long-term follow-up and you need to be uh, very careful regarding that. All patients need to be vaccinated against HPV and you need to have a very aggressive cancer surveillance. Remember that um, this, is, this is extremely important because uh, when you transition these patients from the pediatric care to the adult care, they are lost to follow up. And especially in developing countries and big countries where patients have to travel a very long distance to get some uh, help so you, you cannot lose these patients to follow up. I also would like to tell everyone that I'm part of the International Committee for the Fanconi Anemia Research Fund, and we are trying to map what's happened to Fanconi Anemia worldwide. And if you are from uh, a country that it's outside the U USA and Europe, and please email me, me if you're interested in participating in that. So are we making any progress and what's my point of view? Still, we have a lot of global inequalities, even within the same countries. We, may, we have many Brazis within the same Brazil. So we need to understand that access is the major problem for most of the patients. Access to diagnosis, access to good, uh, to quality uh, blood transfusion. Also, and the only thing, the only 
solution that we can have to this is we, when we educate educate patients and also the, the, the medical community, as well as we collaborate nationally and internationally. Countries with similar resources should really get together and design treatment guidelines that are, are adapted to the geographical regions and that can be affordable and cost effective so that we can have sustainable programs. We cannot read about alpha beta T cell depletion. It's an amazing procedure but it will not be available in the next years in most countries around the world. So regarding treatments, androgens can buy you time. So it's a good option if you do not have uh, transplantation programs. If you have transplantation programs, I really uh, advise you to that these, these simple protocols that we have been using with a lot of experience are, are related to a very good uh, survival. And we need to organize this task, task force to improve outcomes, at least for matched related donors. And this is related to diagnosis, HLA typing, and infections. Don't forget about the long term follow up, transition of care, because you need the patient to get older and you need time after transplant to detect any complications. So every time you see very short follow-up, remember that this does not work for FA patient. And with that, I would like to thank again all my team. I'm just here in front of you, but I, I am nothing without everybody that has helped uh, to, to develop treatment for this disease. And this includes not only patients uh, not only uh, the group from Curitiba, Brazil, but all the Brazilian uh, groups that are also participating in the protocol, all our international collaborators, the international and national societies, our patients and families. And I'd like to thank you all for listening to this presentation, and I hope that we have time to, for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bonfim, for really amazing overview and work and congratulations for these uh, uh, achievements. Uh, uh, not only the fantastic Lancet hematology paper, Impact Factor 30 now released a few days ago, but also, and this is the most important at the end of the day, all uh, the uh, outcome, the improvement of outcome you're providing to these patients with rare diseases. Actually, we, we, we have a lot of questions, so I'll try to structure them. Uh, we have a question uh, about uh, the uh, uh, sensitization uh, from Dr. Hernandez and many others. So you mentioned this. What is your protocol for desensitization? So when, when it's also very difficult because rituximab is quite an expensive drug as well as plasma phoresis. But what we do is uh, plus, uh, we do a dose of rituximab two weeks before transplant, and then we do plasma phoresis as well. And then we do IVIG uh, immunoglobulin uh, infusion on day minus one. We have a very, very good uh, AGLA lab and one of the, uh, phys uh, the, the biologists that is in my Thank you, slide is, is Alberto Lima, who is the head of the HLA Immunogenetic Labs. And we can do a very, very good, just like in the developed countries, the HLA to, the, to look for donor specific antibodies. But with that, the five patients that we had with donor specific antibodies, they were all desensitized. And then we follow on day plus seven, plus 15, uh, regarding the donor specific antibodies to see if we have like a relapse but all of them engrafted and we had no problem, not, not even with the late platelet engrafting because we have these for the, when they do the haplos with, for the plastic and acquired the plastic anemia, we have some kind of delayed platelet engraftment when you have donor specific antibodies, but not for the FA patients. So very simple, no, no, not, not many sophisticated drugs as well. Thank you very much, very clear answer. Uh, we have a few questions about the toxicities of your regimen, especially the use of POSI. For instance, Dr. Anand Prakash is asking about, are there any specific toxicities you're seeing in Fanconi? For instance, hemorrhagic cystitis or BK virus reactivation? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the 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 dream world would be to avoid alkylators and avoid TBI in any uh, DNA breakage syndrome, any 
they, they do not like alkylators and they do not like TBI. But the problem is we cannot find another regimen. And we even tried to use a biosulfone base for, for one patient that could not tolerate TBI. And we had also a, a lot of complications and we were not able to achieve good engraftment. So for the, the cyclophosphamide, I think that it's, it's quite different because when we use the same dose, come on, Mohammed, it's the same dose that we have been using forever the 60 milligrams per kilo. And we did not see the amount of hemorrhagic cystite and even the amount of CMV reactivation. So this has also to do with the haplopitisci platform. And this is, uh, this is more common in any kind of transplant. And it's more seen in FA because of the genomic instability. So you, you will see everything a little bit more than what you see in the other haplos. You see more gastrointestinal toxicity and this is very important that that's why you need to use IV and mycophenolate at least. You should really try to do that because if not, the graft vessel host disease prophylaxis is not good enough. And you may have a lot of graft vessel host disease because you are not using good immune suppression. You can, you have more hemorrhagic cystites, but as I shown, uh, it's all of them were related to BK virus. So we don't know exactly what happened uh, regarding uh, hemorrhagic cystites, if it's really related to cyclophosphamide or just because of the BK virus. And also, I think that it's the conjunction of cyclophosphamide, 60 milligrams per kilo, and now we have used 50 milligrams per kilo, total dose, because we exclude the 10 milligrams per kilo before transplant, and it's the cyclophosphamide plus the TBI. And I think it's the timing of the post-transplantation cyclophosphamide that usually the peak of toxicity is around seven to 10 days after the last dose of, of cyclophosphamide, post-transplant side. And this was usually when the, you had the full engraftment. So that's why we also took off GCSF because we, you had, we had a very fast engraftment with a lot of uh, the, the toxicity. So we, uh, I think that it's related to cyclophosphamide TBI and also by taking out the uh, GCSF, and this is also important that thank you for this question because we do not use GCSF for any patient for the past almost 25 patients. And with that, we have a more slow uh, engraftment and this helps to decrease this, this inflammatory reaction that these patients may have. Excellent. Thank you very much. We have a few questions about the dosage of post -sci. And for instance, Dr. Duleri, but also other colleagues are asking about the rationale uh, about reducing by 50% and whether you performed any dose finding studies. How did you end up, you know, with this 25 milligram per kilo uh, times two magic number? I, I wish I wish it was like my idea. I would be like a genius. But this was not. This was uh, published in, two, in 2008, 2002. And remember when Seattle and Baltimore compared the doses, they began by using 50 milligrams per kilo in one group and 100 milligrams per kilo in the other group. Yeah, so but that, they, that was in the adult population. They were yes. using bone marrow and the switch was about because of the risk of GVHD. Here, Absolutely. I think the problem of Fonconi is more about the DNA repair and toxicity. So maybe slightly yeah, different. but 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 I I was pointing this out because this was not something out of our mind. So somebody had already used 50 milligrams per kilo. We knew that by decreasing the dose of post transplantation site, that we would face more graft vessel host disease, even if it were like a normal a patient. But FA, we could, not, we could not give more than 60 milligrams per kilo. And we had like more than 200 transplants using 60 milligrams per kilo. So that's why I presented the data before, so that we, we had a very good experience in, in FA using this total dose of cyclophosphamide. So it was based on what Seattle and Baltimore published initially. It was based on the final dose that we were very much used by giving uh, to other types of transplant. That's how we came, uh, we came to this uh, total dose of 50 and initially 60 milligrams per kilo. 
Excellent, thank you very much. We have a few questions about the ATG. So for instance, one question is whether it's the same story with rabbit ATG or horse ATG. This is from Dr. Fan Lin. We have another question about the timing of administration of ATG, whether this is important. And the third question I have is, why did you test alemtuzumab campus whereas your results with ATG were already very good? Yeah, but very, very, very wonderful question. That's why I love live, you know, webinars because then we have like questions. And I, I, I'm, I'm just uh, translating, you know, the questions for you because Franconia anemia is not my cup of tea. You know, all I know so, about Franconia anemia that we owe it to Dr. Guido Fanconi for those who don't know where Fanconi comes from. This is a Swiss pediatrician who really uh, did a great Absolutely. job describing uh, these patients. 1927. <laughs> so, so first question, horse and, and rabbit ATG. We have, we have no access to horse ATG. So for us, this was a very uh, easy uh, answer. But also remember that when uh, Joe Antin published the, the data regarding the use of rabbit compared rabbit to horse ATG for patients with aplastic anemia, uh, he saw that this was a CIBMTR data that we had less graft-associated disease as well. So we always liked rabbit uh, ATG and we have no access to horse. So I don't know what would happen if we had to use horse ATG. Second, timing of ATG. This is something that we still need to, to discuss a lot. And this, I, I think my very, very good friend, Mohab Ayas from Saudi Arabia, who published also his data regarding this, uh, the use of this protocol for his uh, population. And what did he do? He increased the dose of uh, uh, rabbit ATG, but he used a higher dose and more close to bone marrow infusion. In the beginning, we were a little bit afraid of pushing too much close to the bone marrow infusion because we thought that it, this could lead to mixed chim chimerism. But uh, Mohab Ayas did that. He in, in, uh, increased the dose of, of ATG and moved it around the minus three, minus four, and minus five. And by doing that, and by in also increasing the, uh, prolonging the, the use of uh, mycophenolate after transplant, he had an even uh, lower incidence of graft vessels disease. So my suggestion to suggestion would be, I am using CAMPF, I'm very uh, happy with CAMPF now, but if you do not have access to CAMPF and if you are going to use ATG, it's better to use a dose close at least to 7.5 milligrams per kilo and a little bit closer to transplant, not give it minus eight, minus nine, minus eight and minus seven, but just push it a little bit closer to bone marrow infusion so that you can have, uh, during the period of engraftment, you still have ATG in circulation. And the last one, why I, I use CAMPATH? You know, because when we compared the data and I didn't have time to show exactly the data regarding uh, the instance of chronic graft vessels disease, when we compared the data uh, from uh, rabbit ATG and CAMPATH, we could also see that by when we increase the dose from five milligrams to 7.5 milligrams per kilo of ATG, and or when we gave a uh, CAMPATH, we had that, like this instance of chronic graft vessels disease around 22%. So this is like, this was much better. And also the severity of graft vessels disease was better. But we paid the price because we decided to add this post-transplantation CAMPATH dose. I, I always, people always ask me why we did that. And this is also a very, very nice story. But we, why, as we did that, we had this prolonged CMV infection. Mohammed, you cannot imagine, like six months of CMV and for us. So we have this problem with CAMPATH, but at the same time, we, have, we do not have uh, this severe graft vessels disease anymore that we also observed using rabbit ATG. Excellent. Okay, we, we have a question here about the timing of both sites. This is from Dr. Carlos Vallejo in Spain. Hello, Carlos, and thank you for following uh, the ICH activities. And Carlos is asking about the timing of both sites, uh, whether three plus four as you did, and this is the usual Hopkins approach, 
or whether the 3 plus 5, which was advertised by Dr. Bashigalupo, do you see any role for, for, for this in your practice here in this specific situation of Fanconi anemia? So I uh, thank you again for the, the questions. You know, people are really, really into the-, the It is amazing, the, you know, the number of questions we're receiving and I can tell you I'm summarizing and shortening them, you know. <laughs> because, because, you know, uh, I, we, for those who want to read more of, of what we publish, we have in the Lancet paper, we have explained that a couple of patients, around 14 patients, we try to do uh, Andrea Batigalupo's protocol. Andrea has always helped me so much and I discussed so many times also with Andrea about this, these patients. We try to give a uh, uh, post-transplantation cyclophosphate, day plus three and day plus five, as well as we begin cyclosporin and mycophenolate for this small group of patients around day zero and day mine, mice, plus one. And what we saw, Carlos, is that we, we had more graphic disease. So I don't know if we had like, we did not have enough patients or if we were a little bit afraid of what happened because uh, something that we, I didn't also didn't show is that we had a couple of patients that received mismatched unrelated uh, transplants for Fanconi using this protocol. And it was exactly in this group that we used this, uh, the Batigalupos uh, approach. And we had more graphic disease and the survival was not good. So for the, for we were a little bit afraid and we backed off and came back again to the plus three, plus four, and beginning cyclosporin and mycophenolate on day plus five without uh, GCSF for these patients. But there is, there is a lot of room to, to, to improve regarding that because it's a rare disease and it's still 60, 70 patients. It's still a small number. And from 2021 to 2022, we have seven more patients. So uh, they are very, very early to follow up. So it's very difficult to include them in any analysis, but we will see as well what's happening to with, um, with bigger numbers. We need numbers, even though it's a rare disease, we need numbers to make any conclusion. I always find very funny when people uh, publish about uh, like rare diseases using like very small numbers and making like some really wonderful conclusions. We are still, we, we cannot conclude many things, it's just, it's still a lot of observational studies and that's why we need to get together and do the same protocol. Okay, we'll take one last question because time is running and the concept about the webinars is just to keep them you know, within the uh, 40, 45 minutes because uh, this is the end of a busy day for many people or still a working day. So in the patient you transplanted with Fanconi, uh, we know this is a risk factor for AML, MDS. Do you have patients in this series who were already showing signs of uh, malignant transformation? Yes, we, uh, I showed in the, the 63, uh, 66 patients that we, we, we transplanted, we had approximately 11 patients that have myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia. We transplanted patients with 50% of blasters in the bone marrow. And we have, and this patient, for example, is alive and well almost four years after transplantation now. So this is a good, without the flag regimen, when we use the flag regimen in two patients, followed by the haplopitisite protocol, we had more toxicity. And, and so uh, it depends uh, on what uh, the amount of blasts that you have in the bone marrow, because it's very smoldering the, the leukemia in the, in the FA patients. They can stay with like 10% or, or even like 5 6% of blasts for many, many months without progressing to a uh, very uh, advanced AML. But we have these, and out of these 11 patients, we have eight patients that are alive and well with a median follow-up of approximately four years uh, regarding this, 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 this approach. So it can be used and it, it is successful for, for this group. It's still not well, so successful as if you are in a plastic phase, but in a plastic phase, even in Brazil, you have like a very, very good survival. Well, thank you very much, Carmen, for sharing all of these wonderful data with us, but especially sharing your passion and your dedication uh, to your patient. And I think your work 
has been extremely useful, not only in Brazil, but also across the globe, because obviously, uh, as you nicely uh, mentioned, uh, uh, when it comes to treating these very rare uh, genetic disorders or diseases, we need to collaborate. Nobody will see alone hundreds of these patients. And we owe a lot for the people who dedicated their career uh, and uh, committed to uh, take care of these patients. I think this webinar has to come to its end. I hope you have enjoyed it. It was really, really amazing. I personally learned a lot. And again, congratulations for all of these achievements. And uh, as I always conclude, wherever you are, thank you for attending and please stay safe and keep well. Take care. Thank you, everybody. And please send me an email if you have any questions. Big hug and a big kiss to all of you. <laughs>